thank you so much for coming today, and let's give Rich a warm welcome. What I want to do today is just kind of share with you um, some ideas from the science of learning on um, just how to design what I would call multimedia communication that's evidence-based, grounded in theory, and um, focused on learning outcomes. Let me um, just try to show you um, a model of learning that's kind of guiding all this, and then we'll get on to the actual practical principles for how to design instruction. Um, so these are the three most important principles, I think, that um, cognitive scientists have come up with. One is the idea of dual channels. So this is the idea that people have separate information processing channels for verbal and visual material. Limited capacity, this is probably the number one principle uh, from cognitive science that's relevant to instructional design. We can only process a few things at any one time, five plus or minus two. So we can have a screen full of interesting things going on, but our eyes only fixate on one point at a time. So this is the challenge of instructional design. <laughs> How do we get people to learn in a system that is so limited? And then active processing. This is the idea that meaningful learning depends on cognitive processing during learning. And three and the particularly important processes are what I call selecting. So we have to select what we're going to process in working memory. But once you know, the words start rolling into your working memory or the images start rolling in, you have to mentally organize them into some structure that is coherent for you. And then integrating, this is where you're activating relevant prior knowledge from long-term memory, bringing it into your working memory and um, connecting it with what's coming in. So those cognitive processes, those are needed for meaningful learning. So we have this challenge as instructors, how do we get that to happen when people can only pay attention to a few things at one time. There are three main issues if we're trying to design instruction. Given that we have limited processing capacity and working memory, it can be used for one of these three things. Extraneous processing, this is processing that does not support an instructional goal. Essential processing, this is really the selecting process. So you're not thinking much about it, you're just getting it in, representing it, and storing it. In generative processing, this is cognitive processing aimed at making sense out of the material. So this is where you mentally reorganize it, relate it to your prior knowledge. You're, you're, you're actively trying to see what it all means. So this is the deeper kind of processing. This depends on your motivation. So in any kind of learning situation, um, I think our goals are to reduce extraneous processing, um, manage the essential processing, and foster generative processing. So I think the first step in this research was to establish, yes, there are there do seem to be principles. Most of these principles work for people with low prior knowledge, but not with people with high prior knowledge. There's this thing called the expertise reversal effect. We have to assume most students in an introductory level course are novices or low prior knowledge. That's kind of what I'm focusing on. We could have a presentation like this or without any graphics. Students are doing a lot better being able to solve problems if they learn with graphics and words rather than just words alone. Somewhere between 50 and 100% better performance. And I would call that the, the multimedia principle. So the rest of the time I have, I want to look at what makes a graphic effective and how do you integrate it with the text. Let me, let me start with our first instructional goal, which is to reduce extraneous processing. And there are five, five ways to do this. What I'm calling coherence, signaling, redundancy, spatial contiguity, and temporal contiguity. So the coherence principle is the idea that extraneous material should be eliminated. If it doesn't support the instructional goal, it shouldn't be there. This is from a PowerPoint lesson on uh, how a virus causes a cold. We have one version where we've added interesting but irrelevant facts. So the seductive detail here is that the people who make love once or twice a week are more immune to colds than folks who abstain. We added those because people have found them to be interesting and they're kind of about viruses but not really relevant to what we're trying to explain here. If we add that interesting material, people rate the lesson as more interesting, but it depresses their performance on learning outcome measures. The group without the extraneous material does better. And how soon after they saw the material were they tested? That's a great criticism. 
of this line of research. Because a lot of it is like lab studies with immediate tests. So it doesn't have a lot of external validity to the classroom. We need delayed tests and we need uh, studies in classrooms. There are places where um, adding interesting stuff can help. So that, what's called emotional design. So I'm going to talk about that in a sec. So is there a balance there? There's probably maybe? a balance. I mean, you just don't want to overload people's working memory. So as long as you're within people's capacity, it's probably fine. So um, signaling, this is the idea that if we can't weed out the extraneous material, at least we can highlight the important material. So the idea is people learn more deeply when there are cues added that highlight the main ideas and the organization of the material. In this case, in the signaled version, the voice is emphasizing the cue material. So the words in, in bold are emphasized in the voice. In the non-signaled version, all the words have the same stress. Now, another way to do this is if it's in print, to just have headings, use bold font, things like that. that those are forms of signaling. So we either want to eliminate the extraneous material or highlight the important material. Another way of dealing with this idea of um, reducing extraneous processing. If people are reading this, they can't be looking at the animation. And if they're looking at the animation, they can't be reading this. So they're, they're, missing, they're missing something. Also, people try to reconcile the printed words with the spoken words. And that uses cognitive capacity to see, are they matching? If you're thinking about that, you're not really thinking about how lightning storms develop. Uh, how do you think about dealing with the issue that if it's just narration and they, you know, stop paying attention to you for a second and then miss what you said? Right. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. And I'm going to talk about that when I get to what, what I call the modality principle, which is that it's better to have spoken than printed words. Because sometimes it is better to have printed, like when you need to have refer back to it, if there's lots of technical terms, if the learner maybe is not a native speaker of English, then it's better. That's a third way of trying to minimize extraneous processing. Let me look at this fourth way, which is uh, spatial contiguity. People learn better when we put the words next to the part of the graphic they're talking about than having it far away. This is the typical way it's presented in the textbook. You maybe have two frames and then uh, the caption that explains everything. That's what I call separated presentation. A more integrated presentation has the words next to the part of the graphic they're talking about. This is um, cutting down on your extraneous processing because you don't have to kind of match up how the caption relates to the illustration. It's showing you exactly. These words go with that part of the graphic. These words go with that part of the graphic. You don't have to look all around. And then lastly, if we have um, narration and graphics, people do much better when they're simultaneous. You might think that successive would be better because you're like getting two exposures one with words and one with graphics, but the problem is you can't make connections between them because you can't really figure out how they relate to each other. But when they're simultaneous, the words, and then you can see how the words relate to the graphics, it's easier to integrate. So let's say we have eliminated all the extraneous material, but we're trying to explain something that's very complicated. So we have to somehow manage that essential processing. What can we do? Three things we can do are to Segment it, which is to break it into parts and present it part by part. Use pre-training where we kind of teach you what the main concepts are first before we put it all together. Or modality where we use spoken words rather than printed words. So let me show you what I mean by each of those. This is an example of segmenting. Let's say in this lesson on how lightning storms develop, we could have people watch the whole thing. It takes about two and a half minutes. Or we can present each step. Each step takes about 10 seconds. And then you click on continue to go on to the next step. You can control. They get to see like this one sentence. Fine. Then they can continue to go on. Just doing something as simple as that greatly improves their performance on the transfer test. For pre-training, here's a little lesson on how a car's braking system works. We um, showed people a little map of the braking system. They could click on any piece and then they would get a definition of Oh, this is the piston that can move forward and backward. So you know what that word refers to. Then once you see the whole lesson, hopefully you can build a better mental model. This last one, instructional methods that either use spoken or printed text. Learners, if they're looking at the words, they're not watching the, the graphic, they might miss something. 
you can offload all the verbal processing onto the auditory channel if we use spoken text. So we're making better use of the auditory channel if we use spoken text rather than printed text. So this is why PowerPoints with graphics and the instructor speaking kind of are a nice complement. So the last step here is, let's say we have eliminated all of the extraneous material and we have done a good job of managing the essential processing by segmenting it or pre-training, but still learners aren't really trying, they're not putting out the effort to make sense out of the material. They have the cognitive capacity available, but they're just, they don't want to do it. So how can we prime effort? This is, so this is the really issue of motivation. It's kind of getting me out of my element because I'm more of a cognitive psychologist, but if you're interested in education, nothing, nothing's going to work without motivation. So two, here are two techniques that, that we've tried. One is personalization and one is voice. So personalization simply has to do with taking the words and putting them into conversational style. So, and by conversational style, I mean just using first and second person constructions. So it's using I and you and we. These are words from a lesson on how um, the human lungs work. So in the non-personalized version, it says, during inhaling, the diaphragm moves down. You can see that's all formal language. To make it personalized, we just inserted you and your instead of the. So during inhaling, your diaphragm moves down, creating more space for your lungs. Air enters through your nose or mouth, moves down through your throat to tiny air sacs in your lungs. It's a very minor thing that's going on here, but it has a huge effect on, on learning. Why is it? Why would conversational language help people learn better? Also, politeness. A direct tutor would say, like, pr press the enter key. And a polite tutor would say, why don't we press the enter key? <laughs> it's very, it's kind of not telling you what to do, but why would that help you learn better? Almost a matter of engagement. You can take ownership of it if you relate to it. Right. And we find from questionnaires we give our, our learners that they feel the instructor cares more about them. <laughs> oh, it's a recorded voice. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about that feeling of personalization. Also, using a human voice rather than a machine voice, you know it's not human, but, but still, people try harder. So there's something about the human touch. I do want to look at it, just a couple other issues since you brought one of these up about interests. So, yeah, so I would call these all embodiment principles. So it's the idea that you know, uh, using the human body as a way of helping people learn. So, gesture is certainly one. There's a lot of research on gesture. So, eye contact, um, hand, how you use your hands, how, how you move your whole body. Um, that's all part of gesture, and that can improve learning. So, having the instructor gesture in a friendly way improves learning over just standing still. Yeah, even, even when it's just a character, <laughs> it's not obviously not human, just an avatar. And it's like anthropomorphizing it is what exactly. is making the effect. Exactly. People will accept machines as social partners. The last thing that you were talking about is actually a separate part of that, right? Looking at it and actually feeling, I'm in this right now. Yeah, this, see, the, the, there's this very popular idea of mirror neurons that you might have come across. Yeah. So when you see somebody doing something, if you can feel like you're that person, then it's going to be as if you're doing it. So if you can do it from your first, first person perspective, then, or you can see a hand drawing it, then it feels like maybe your hand is drawing it, then it's as if you're constructing it, you're going to learn it better than if it's somebody else's construction. Thank you very much for coming and talking to us today.